today. I'm speaking to you from the beautiful hill country in Sisterdale, so we're hoping any thunderstorms don't ride over the ranch and knock out my electricity today. So anyway, um, I want to thank Megan Clayton and Pete Flores for their assistance in helping us get this set up. Uh, we're really um, happy to present this information to you. It is preliminary. And I also want to explain, I know that they, there might be some landowners online uh, as well as some agency personnel and possibly some academics. So we're going to try to keep the um, technical side of it down a little bit, but we will have to include some of that information in here. So if it's uh, getting a little bit over your head, just take a sip of coffee and just ride through the storm. Um, I want to make very clear that we're available to answer any questions that you might have. I think uh, our main goal today is to demonstrate the applicability of these maps for large landscapes um, and uh, some of these severe wildfires that we've been encountering lately. And it also has some application for uh, smaller areas as well. And so you'll be the one to tell us whether you think it's going to be of any use after the fact. So, OK. Um, Let's, uh, let's go ahead and define burn severity. That can be confused sometimes with fire intensity. Fire intensity is the amount of energy or heat that's released per unit time. We're not going to be addressing that today. We're going to be talking about burn severity, and that's the effect um, of a fire on ecosystem properties or more uh, towards the site of vegetation and soils. It uh, also has a good um, index for determining how that ecosystem has been altered or disrupted by fire. So that's what we're really interested in. And that's what these maps do, is they address the effect of a fire on ecosystem properties. So we'll talk a little bit about the fire history. We're only addressing two areas. We're not going to be addressing the Bastrop fires. Um, many of you remember what happened in 2011. And these fires took place in 2011 and 2012. Uh, first of those fires were the, in the Davis Mountains. There were a series of four fires that took place during two years. There were the Rock House, the Tejano Fire, and those two were in 2011, and then the Livermore and the Spring Fires in 2012, and those uh, comprised about 250,000 acres. The second study area is the Serranía del Burro in Coahuila, Mexico. Um, those fires took place in March of 2011 and burned 350,000 acres. So you can see those are mighty large landscapes, and those landscapes uh, are comprised mostly of private lands, mostly cattle and wildlife production. Very difficult to access, very few roads through those areas. The weather conditions were extreme. And uh, what was really interesting about those two study areas is they were only 150 miles apart. They were a little bit different, but not that much different. I also want to emphasize that the Serranía del Burro is considered to be one of uh, the major supercell producing areas in um, this part of the country, uh, right behind Oklahoma, as a matter of fact. And um, so that influences the weather patterns there. The Serranía del Burro uh, will run somewhere between 25 and 35 inches of rain a year, whereas the Davis Mountains is a little bit lower than that. And then sometimes the Serranía del Burro, because of those supercells, can um, exceed those rainfall patterns. As well, both areas lie within hurricane patterns, so that had something to do with our fire patterns. I just wanted you to be able to look at the two, the two study areas. The Davis Mountains lies to the north of Big Bend National Park, and then the Serranía del Burro is about 150 kilometers southeast of Big Bend National Park. Between the two, it's about 150 miles. I uh, also wanted to emphasize the natural fire regimes uh, for these areas. Um, it ranges between the categories of one and four. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but it just shows you what a mosaic the fire patterns can be in those areas. All right, let's talk about the stochastic events or these huge events that actually built up to these catastrophic uh, wildfires. Primarily, there was Hurricane Alex, and that took place in June of 2010. And Hurricane Alex dumped 55 inches of rain in the Serranía del Burro over a course of three days. So that's pretty amazing. And I don't know how many of you remember hearing about that in the news, but that was a lot of rain. The Davis Mountains, from what I understand, I've tried to look up those rain records, haven't had much success. But I understand just from locals that it was around 17 inches of rain in those few days. After the hurricane, then there was a historic drought that set in. And that went into the spring of 2011. During the winter of 2010-2011, we also experienced record freezes. In March of 2011, record high wind speeds and temperatures. 
And by the time it got to March 2011, I was there at the time. You see the photograph on the right. We had a lightning strike that was caused by a supercell that was 60,000 feet high. And that supercell sucked up every piece of burning debris it could find and spread it throughout the landscape. So that fire got out of control very quickly. In the Davis Mountains, the April 2011 fire was caused by humans or actual electrical fire. And then uh, another fire, series of fires took place in 2012 caused by lightning in April. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how this came about. I am not a fire ecologist by nature. I am actually a bear biologist. I've studied black bears for the last 30 years in Mexico. My family's from Mexico. And so our main concern was the impact it was going to have on the wildlife. And uh, my study area was in the Serranías del Burro. My entire study area burned up, as a matter of fact. And um, what we were interested in looking at was how these fires were going to affect black bear population dynamics and um, movements across the landscapes. So it's important to know the impact of um, vegetation and bear foods and how that drives these populations. The Davis Mountains, um, I had not done any previous work there, but that is considered to be very important black bear habitat, and it's likely part of a linkage of corridors for expanding bear populations. I want to emphasize in the Serrania del Burro, it's one of the highest densities of bears in the southwestern United States and northern Mexico, and is pretty much responsible for most of the black bear expansion into Texas that we're now seeing. So because of that black bear research, I have worked with private landowners for a long time and, of course, was quite involved with them and their families. So when these fires took place, we were very concerned about how this was going to impact them. And we wanted to be able to provide information that would help them with their future land use planning. Most of their land use was cattle production um, or wildlife uh, habitat conservation. The other um, interest we had was being able to prioritize areas for the highest restoration needs. Of course, when you have these types of wildfires across these, these huge landscapes and at such catastrophic levels or such severe levels, you're going to have um, a wide range of impact from low to severe impacts across that landscape. So you're wanna, going to want to be able to get in there and identify those areas that have the highest restoration needs. So these maps that we're actually using were developed in uh, the northwestern United States. They're actually developed in Glacier National Park by two of our collaborators, Nate Benson and Carl Key. And these maps uh, were designed for coniferous forests, and they were also designed for these huge landscapes that we often see in public lands outside of the state of Texas. So they're commonly used outside of Texas. And so when they have a big fire, like the ones we've been seeing in Arizona or so forth, they go in there immediately, calculate, get the maps, and they're able to target the areas that need the most attention, and then their people can go straight in there without having to survey the entire landscape. And that seemed appropriate for us, given the size of these fires at 250 and 350,000 acres with very low access. And then, of course, we wanted to uh, use these same maps to estimate the impacts of wildlife food production, which we'll talk about briefly in just a little bit. Um, one of the models that we're using for estimating food production across the landscape, and I won't talk too much about it, but I wanted to let you know why we were interested in the burn severity maps. And this is actually a calorie map of my study area. And we have done some previous work where we actually cal uh, calculate calories per square meter. And what we wanted to do with these burn severity maps was actually overlay on a model like this one to be able to determine the number of calories that are being produced across the landscape and how many of those calories will be lost because of the lack of production in different burn severity levels. So that's what we hope to be doing in the long term. Meanwhile, I'm going to tell you about how we actually used those burn severity maps to where we are today. So it's important to recognize that a burn is not just a burn. And when these fires were first taking place, we noticed that most of the maps that were available to landowners at that time were just perimeter uh, burns. And so, as many of you know, um, fires are not equally um, represented across an area, that they're very uh, diverse and variable. So we were uh, interested in understanding how the variability of the fire would affect livestock forage and wildlife food production. 
Just because it rains doesn't mean that it's going to produce grass. And just because you have oak trees remaining after a fire, fire doesn't necessarily mean they're going to produce acorns. So also we wanted to address the compromises to soil nutrients and microbial activity and their recovery within different burn severity levels. Uh, as you see here on the right at the lower, the lower right is um, a severely burned area. And you can see how those soils were somewhat compromised. And this is after two years and after some fairly significant rains. So you have to take that into, com into uh, consideration. Your grasses are not necessarily going to recover unless your soils are recovered. So we were, again, concerned about providing tools to these landowners for their underground, uh, underground management and long-term planning. Many of them were asking, how soon can I graze? How long is it going to be till we can get our cattle production back to normal? And those questions were all you know, unanswered at that point, and that's what we were hoping to do with these burn severity maps. So we'll go into a little bit of the technical detail about these burn severity maps. We call them normalized burn reflectance maps. And basically, they're a common tool for rapid assessment of burn impact. And as you can see here on the right, this is one of the maps that Ed had put together. And you'll see different colors representing uh, different categories of burn severity. So for example, um, we'll have the blue area is unburned to low. The green area is lightly burned, the yellow is moderately burned, and then the red is severely burned. So if you're a landowner and you want to know, you know what areas you need to address you know, first, you're going to go to those red areas. And so that's what we use these maps for. Um, to calculate the actual maps, what they do is they compare um, satellite near and shortwave infrared reflectance values before and after the burns. And so it's important to be able to get two different scenes, one before the fire and one after the fire. So we're going to talk about the pros and cons of burn severity maps. When I first uh, brought them uh, to attention here in Texas, people weren't convinced that they were useful because a lot of people were using tools like LIDAR and things like that. But we were trying to illustrate the relevance for rapid assessment and for helping these landowners you know, get, get an idea of what was happening on their landscapes. Um, number one, they're very inexpensive uh, to produce. They don't take very long to produce, and there are a lot of people out there readily willing to help produce them. Um, they're also a simplified categorization of impacts. You know, if you're using something more detailed, it's kind of hard to get a grip on, you know, uh, severely burned areas versus moderately burned um, when you have a continuum. So categories help people to understand it a little bit better. They kind of give you an x-ray of impacts versus um, you know, the perimeter maps, which just say that they've been burned or haven't been burned. Um, one rancher told me that you know, when, when we showed up with some of these initial images, he said, you know, I feel like somebody told me I had cancer, but until you showed me this map, I didn't understand you know, um, exactly how it had impacted the landscape. And he says, at least I feel like now I can have a plan of attack with these maps. So I think they're also a very important social tool for reaching out to the public after such uh, large devastating fires. Some of the cons can be that they are subjective and variable, which, we, which you'll learn about through this presentation. And if you delve into burn severity maps, you will learn that even more so. However, it has been um, a really uh, positive learning experience and, and helps you to understand your landscape a lot better. They also lack detail and accuracy for more smaller scales. So for example, people doing a lot of uh, prescribed burning or burning on smaller tracts of land, they're really not that useful because of the scale. And I will say that they are not user-friendly without expertise. So we do have these manuals available, uh, which we'll talk about toward the end of the presentation. But I highly recommend that you work closely with some of the um, experts that are out there. And they are very, very accessible. OK, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the timing of your scene acquisition. And that's going to depend on your objectives. So for example, there are maps that you want to um, obtain right after the fires. For example, if you want to address the impacts on your soils, well, obviously, you're going to take a scene right after the fire and a scene right before the fire. However, in our case, we were looking at the actual impact of the fire on the vegetation. Um, so we wanted at least a one year period where it would allow a growing period to occur there in the area. Now, um, when you are deciding on the timing for your scenes, it's going to warrant a lot of discussion with the fire ecologists and the agency personnel who have worked a lot with these maps to find a best fit for your needs. Because 
it, um, it can be highly variable. And I will say that we ran into some problems just because of the drought. A lot of mortality that was occurring with the vegetation was after the fire because of the drought. And so we were having to address you know, the best timing for our scenes to get in there and um, capture the right images. Uh, but I will say that once you do discuss with these people, they will, um, they will be able to, you know, discuss these things with you and come up with a, with a good decision. So you're not just out there on your own. Believe me, if somebody like me, a bear biologist who knows nothing about this stuff, can jump in and do this kind of thing, um, anybody can do this. So. Okay, very quickly here, I'm not going to go into a lot of the detail, but I just wanted you to understand where these scenes are coming from. Like I said, if I can understand this stuff, anybody can. Um, and what, what I had uh, to do was just get it into my mind in terms of where, how they were comparing the before and after scenes. So basically, the band ratios that they use for the severity mapping are the, are the fours and the sevens, because that tends to be more sensitive to um, the, the burning scales versus something like the NDVI, which is a little bit different. And they've run a lot of tests and published a lot of information on this. So normalized burn ratio is definitely what you want to go for. And what they do is they take your uh, pre-reflectance and your pre-normalized burn ratio scenes and compare them to the post-reflectance um, and NDRs. And that ends up giving you an index that will take you into the next step. From there, what they do is they calculate what they call a difference normalized burn ratio, which is basically the NBR minus, or the pre-fire NBR, sorry, that slide messed up a little bit, the pre-fire versus the post-fire NBR. And what that gives you is basically a, um, a level of reduction in vegetation and the increased soil exposure. So it's literally giving you a level of change before and after the fire based on these reflectance values that are picked up by the Landsat satellite. So um, you can see here why timing and any noise such as drought and high rainfall can influence this final product. So you really need to think about these things. But what I wanted you to walk away from most of all was just the before and after images and how important it is to use two scenes uh, so that you can get a good picture of what, the, what exactly is caused by the fire versus other issues that might be going on in your study area. And then from there, this gets a little bit more complicated, but I will say this. Um, EROS, or the USDA EROS lab and uh, US Forest Service RSAC lab came to Texas and helped us, helped us put on a workshop where they actually walked about 30 of us through this process. We have a step-by-step -step manual that shows you how to do this. If you're not familiar with this, um, or at least uh, something that you can give to somebody to help you do it, or you know, find a landscape ecologist that can help you do this. But um, there's, a, there's a few more steps in between this, but mainly what we wanted you to understand was how they get from the difference NBR scale over to identifying your burn severity map. Um, and basically what they do is they just use the different breakpoints for these different burn severity levels to determine where your low values are, your unburned values, your moderate, and your high values. Again, don't let this throw you off. I'm not trying to teach you about um, spatial analysis or anything, but I just wanted you to understand how they come up with these, these burn severity maps. Um, I think here is where Pete is going to switch us over. Pete, is that right? Okay, yes. Okay, so meanwhile, at this point, does anybody have any questions um, without getting into too much detail about the um, technical side of things? Because um, I have been through the workshop, but I wouldn't be able to tell you all of the ins and outs about you know, the different uh, methods that they use. But as far as everything else goes, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, well, Chris says this is good stuff, so I hope it's useful for everybody. I have one more question coming. Andy Vestal. Okay. Um, okay. 
No questions. Okay, we're good. Andy, if I see your question pop up, I'll go ahead and interrupt the presentation. So we're going to go ahead and continue. Um, okay, Andy would like the webinar placed on Texas Eden, so we can talk about that after the presentation. This presentation will be widely available. I also want to clarify that uh, USGS Eros Lab has manuals that they make readily available as well. And then um, Ed and I are also available to help you through any questions. So. Let me go ahead and continue. Um, from, from the point when you obtain your maps, now the tricky part comes in. Um, it, it, but the fun part, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to turn anybody off from this, but uh, from here, what we're going to have to do is go out in the field and actually validate these maps because we want to make sure that the Landsat imagery is giving us the correct re reflectance. So uh, two of the people that we've been working very closely with, which is Carl Key and Nate Benson, they're up in the Northwest and actually work for the Joint Fire Science Program and the National Park Service. And Carl and Nate actually came up with an index to go out in the field and um, estimate uh, whether your plots were truly low, moderately, or severely burned. So um, this publication right here is called Landscape Assessment, and that's the link for it down below. I also have that link listed at the end of the presentation, which you can do a screen capture for, but this is, a, this is a critical publication. This is the publication that's going to tell you how to do all of the field assessment. So it's actually quite lengthy, but we tore it apart. It's dog-eared. We've got highlighted everywhere, and we carried it with us out in the field, and it describes how you're actually going to do your field validation using an index called the Composite Burn Index, or the CBI. All right, so basically the CBI is pretty straightforward and easy to understand. Um, if somebody can't go with you in the field, then we could certainly walk you through it, and that's what Nate and everybody had to do with us. They were unable to accompany us out in the field, uh, but we felt like we had um, a pretty good idea of what they wanted us to do, and then after the fact, we found out that we actually did everything right, so we were pretty pleased. Um, it is very straightforward. Uh, I will say this, though. The previous knowledge of the area is um, pretty helpful and essential, so if you can at least take somebody with you who's familiar with the area before the fire because they're going to be the ones to tell you, you know, what the area looked like before the fire. You're going to have to do things like estimate litter cover and that sort of thing. If you don't have previous knowledge, then you can always rely on unburned areas and you'll want to include that in your sampling regime. But as you can see here on the CBI um, form, it basically, after you sum everything up, uh, then it provides you with a mean CBI value for each plot. So it's going to actually provide you with a score to tell you whether it's mo low, moderately, or severely burned. Um, and also I will emphasize this, that ground calibration can be very subjective based on your different ecosystems. Um, however, we do use this index because there's a group called the Monitoring Trends for Burn Severity, which is one of our partners on this project. And we essentially are contributing our data to them. And what they do is they accumulate enough of these validation projects or validation summaries, I guess, to the point where if your maps are accurate enough, then you, you don't have to validate as much. If you have a really huge catastrophic fire and you have previous ground data for that area, then you can just whip out that burn severity map and give it to your land managers and say, here you go. We have fairly good confidence that this has a high accuracy. However, I do want to emphasize that no information has been available for Texas and Mexico, so we're the first study that's actually contributing to MTBS, and the more that they can calibrate, the better, or validate, I should say, the better. So keep that in mind, and I want to encourage as many people as possible to um, do burn severity measurements when we do get more of these fires. Okay, so again, over time and with multiple calibrations, then you're going to uh, need less validation for specific regions. Of course, up in the Northwest, things are pretty homogenous. Down here, we're a little bit more heterogeneous, and then with a lot of the climate uh, patterns, we're seeing even more variability. So I feel like we're probably going to need a lot more validation than other areas, and so does Nate. But after our first stab at it, we had a really high accuracy rates, so I'm feeling a little bit better. Um, about this. Okay, so for field calibration, some of the things that you're going to be addressing are the amount of litter, duff, your soil charring uh, patterns, scorch marks, frequency living of, you know, certain plant types, 
change in cover, basal sprouting, and invasive species. It is a detective game, especially after rain. Um, and then in our case, we had drought and postponed field periods that just confused things even more. But for the most part, I was pretty satisfied with how things came out. And I just wanted you to pay attention to these two photos on the right. You'll see here on the right, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dead trees, but you'll see how well the grass community is, is coming in underneath. And that had a lot to, uh, that had a lot of play with our results. Photo plots are really important. They're vital to, uh, for your vital final calibration process. We find ourselves looking back and forth at our photos as we're trying to calibrate our maps and determine those thresholds between low, moderate, and severe burns. Uh, so be sure that you take excellent photo plots. We do north, south, east, west. And then you can actually load those on a website to where other people can look at them as well. Um, and, uh, and then we permanently mark them. So our objectives for this project were to construct the burn severity maps for the Davis Mountains and for the Serranias del Burro. And then also we wanted to test whether there was a difference in understory production in different burn severity levels for the 2011 fires. Unfortunately, we weren't able to test that for 2012, but here's where I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Um, Ed's going to talk about how they implemented the FIGRO model uh, that was developed over at CINRIT with Jay Anger. So Ed, I'll let you take over. Okay. So yeah, the, uh, the FIGRO model was developed with the, in the Center of Natural Resource Information Technology, which is where I worked in Temple. Uh, Dr. Jerry Stuth was one of the founders of that group, and the model uh, historically, it's in the early 90s, it was used for drought and early warning uh, predictions in Mongolia, and then it's been used in other countries. It's been in uh, Kenya and Ethiopia and Afghanistan and some other areas, and so, and then in the last 10 years or so, we've been using it here in the U.S., uh, been using it on some test ranches. We've used it on Fort Hood, and we've been doing some projects with the U.S. Forest Service in uh, New Mexico and Arizona. And so, basically, the FIGRO model is just—it's uh, a plant-based growth model. That the foundation of it is is built around the water cycle. Uh, you can model multiple species. You can do individual plant species, or you can lump them into functional groups and then I guess one of the things that sets the FIGRO model apart from other plant growth models is that it has a grazing simulator in it. So uh, if you have, you know, intake uh, data for different species of animals, you can basically put any kind of species of animal in the model that you, you're interested in. You can do cows or elk, deer, anything if you have the right Plant, uh, plant preferences and intake data, and so that that model is a an, an automated model. Once you get it, the data collected, and then it runs every day and, and gives you estimated growth outputs. Uh, just looking here, kind of a sorry for the crude drawing, but just kind of a, a visual representation of how the model works. You have uh, obviously you have your precipitation, and the FIGRO model uses the soil profile, which we get from the NRCS uh, Sergo database. Uh, the, the soil profile is really key to how the, the entire model works, because that's the, our water repository. And so based on like the hydraulic conductivity and the water holding capacities and the slope, uh, and also aspect, uh, the model looks at precipitation, calculates how much room there is in the soil, and then says, okay, is this rain going to soak in or is it going to run off? And, uh, and then based on the, the water use of the plants, it's extracting water through evaporation and plant use, and it's adding water through precipitation. And so you just got all the, the sources here of, uh, you know, the plant transpiration, soil evaporation, and then uh, with the grazing component, we can remove plant material, which would actually, you know, would lower the water use, or, or, uh, and then we also have the runoff due to slope. So it's just a graph here over uh, a couple of years of a of a typical site. I think this this particular site 
uh, it's out in West Texas, but uh, on a, on one of our study ranches. But just looking at the the plant growth over the course of a year for the various species on that on that on that site, and uh, you can see here we're starting uh, January 2005 and going through uh, about January February 2007. So we get two full growth cycles here, and like I said, they can be lumped. Uh, a lot of our work overseas where we didn't know all the plants, we'd lump them in the functional groups: perennial grass, perennial forb, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, just it gives you an estimated standing crop of the the daily production, and so uh, one of the things that we're looking at here, you know, historically had been used as a grazing model. Uh, back in 2005, we, we started thinking, well, what if it wasn't just a grazing model? What if it was a fuel model for uh, wildfire predictions? And so we had started a project out on Fort Hood in Colleen, where we did about 200 transects on 220,000 acres, which, I, I mean, that's a very dense amount of transects, but we were using the FIGRO model to uh, feed into a, a fire model. And so we were getting daily estimates of production, and then based on what plants, you know, if the plants were dormant or if they were growing or whatever, we could estimate uh, a rough uh, fuel moisture component. And so we were using that to kind of give Fort Hood daily estimates of their risk of ignition. And obviously, they start lots of fires with their uh, ordinance and uh, tracer rounds and ordinance. So that's uh, an ongoing project there. They have a website where they can look up their, their burn risk for every day. But I just included this graph here. Each dot is one of our study sites on Fort Hood. Uh, you know the x or the y axis is the uh, actual standing crop that we went out in the field and clipped, and then the y the x axis is the predicted standing crop and five growth. So you can see we we did fairly well with a uh, 0.85 r squared on that. Was just uh, for those uh, not into statistics, it's about we were 85 percent accurate across all our sites. So using that information from FIGRO, we have a, a system that we call BRASS, the Burning Risk Advisory Support System. And it's a modified version of some, some of the Forest Service uh, calculations that uh, it gives us the, you know, if, a, if an ignition were to occur, it gives an estimate uh, throughout the day on what the 30-minute burn area is, what the spreading rate is, uh, flame length. Uh, fire line intensity, and then over here in the corner we have our, our estimate of fuel moisture that's come out of FIGRO. And so it, it's, uh, you know, and I guess, you know, there's a famous quote, I think, from, this, from uh, the 70s, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so, you know, nothing like this is going to be 100%, but it gives you a good idea, especially when you're dealing with a, in a system that burns a lot and you have a lot of uh, traffic or potentials for ignition. It's a very good tool for understanding where your problem spots are, what areas you may need to avoid. Uh, like with Fort Hood, they could say, okay, this range is a high risk today, so let's not use tracer rounds, let's just use regular rounds, that sort of thing. And so what we were doing out in West Texas, uh, FIGRO data collection, the field data collection is very, ex uh, pretty extensive. We have a we do point cover, uh, point based cover on the ground where we get rock litter, bare ground, or vegetation hits. Uh, we also, for FIGRO, we do uh, vegetation frequency. We also added density for this study just as an extra measure on these burn severity maps. And then we also get uh, vegetation biomass and uh, litter biomass through uh, clipping of a uh, 40 by 40 centimeter frame. So all that data gets entered in the FIGRO model. So the uh, the ground cover gives us, you know, how much covers on the ground for the evaporation model, and what species are there, and in what proportions those species exist, and that sort of thing. And so our results. Uh, so I won't dwell on this for too long, but I guess uh, part of the the reason we were we were interested in looking at 
the FIGRO sampling method. It was to give us some modeling data in order to, to generate maps of the of the uh, of the area we we did at the fire, which was the Nature Conservancy's uh, Sky Islands uh, Preserve, this is where we did the sampling. Um, with these, with all the ground cover measurements that we were able to do, we were curious in the scene what difference there was on the ground between the different burn severity classes. So, in a typical area, if you're looking at a forested area, the burn severity maps are really easy because either the trees are dead or they're not dead. And so you can you can pick out the severe and non-severe areas pretty quick. But with areas where there's that are sparsely wooded and you have a lot of grass and shrubs, it's a lot harder looking at a satellite. Okay, that area is black, it's darker, it's brighter. Uh, how severe was that burn? Because a lot, you know, grasses rebound a lot faster than trees do, and so you have to have a really severe fire in order to knock your grasses out. And so we were curious in the looking at the ground components uh, with the grasses and the forbs and the production. Because uh, an area, theoretically, could be severe for, the fire could have been severe for a tree, but not necessarily severe for a grass. And so we we're curious at the applicability of these maps for the, the understory. And so what we found, uh, just looking through here, the only significant differences that we had between the fuel classes was on bare ground and litter biomass. And then, of course, remember, these these samples were taken in 2013, so it was two years after the fire. Uh, a lot of the grasses had recovered. There was, you know, there's some outliers. There's a few, a couple sites that were just so severe they were nuked and there was nothing growing on them. But then there were other severe sites that had already started to recover. Uh, perhaps the slope wasn't as steep or they'd gotten more rain. Uh, but uh, that summer of 2013, the Davis Mountains got a ton of rain and there was just vegetation everywhere. And so, uh, as Deanne had mentioned earlier, you know, timing of the sampling could, you know, could play a lot. And then you have these, these, uh, these freak weather events where, I mean, we were out there for three or four weeks and it rained nearly every day we were out there. So it's just a lot of, uh, just shows how resilient these, these places are. And so obviously the, the tree overstory was knocked out, but the, the understories in a lot of these areas was making a pretty dramatic comeback. And so I, Deanna wants to mention her, the mapping results from the CBI here. Yeah, and I'd also like to emphasize this issue of grass. Uh, when the CBI was developed and these burn severity maps were developed, most of them were designed for coniferous forests. So you're dealing with a totally different area than what we're dealing with. We're looking at mixed grasslands, and grass is really important to us down here. So in my discussions with the um, agency people, they just basically said, we've never paid attention much to grasses. So there is some new work that's now being developed in terms of how you can use these burn severity maps to address grass recovery. Um, and so we are looking into that. And basically, it has to do with timing. You just have to you know, uh, acquire the scenes a lot more frequently, go out and do some field monitoring. But I'm convinced that you can use these maps to identify critical areas that need to be addressed to make sure that you don't have things like invasive species encroachment and that sort of thing. Um, so again, we are trying to um, develop that a little bit better. With our mapping, I was really happy to see that so far we're in progress. Actually, we're going to be, you know, testing and uh, doing some more um, scene acquisitions. But the Rock House Tejano fire was actually 83% accurate, and the Livermore was 86% 80, accurate. Um, we collected quite a few plots with the Rock House because that was the first one in 2011, and then we only did 20 plots for the Livermore because our agency people felt like we had already acquired uh, enough of a database from the Rock House fire. So that's why we, we um, collected less. And I thought it was interesting that the Livermore was actually more accurate. But you can see here now that we're starting to get a good picture of the actual variability within the fire area. So real quick discussion here. Um, I did want to emphasize that the FIGRO was tested on unvalidated maps. So we are going to go back there and retest that on our validated maps and try to uh, see if any of those outliers might have affected a little bit. 
And again, un unfortunately, we were unable to sample for the Livermore 2012 fires, which I would have been really curious to see um, if that understory had recovered as well. Uh, Michael Margo from NRCS and I went out and actually sampled the 2012 fire. And here, these two pictures on the right, you can see the Rock House 2011. That's a, a site that we sampled on top. And then the Livermore on the bottom. And the Livermore, that was kind of the common theme that we saw. Very few of those severe areas had been recovered. It was mostly beggar ticks and things like that. No grasses had recovered. In talking to USGS, they felt like a lot of these areas required about two years for the soils to recover for their nutrients and for the microbial communities where they were stable enough to host native grass um, recovery. So that's one thing that I would have loved to have addressed, and I think that that warrants some future um, research to test uh, how long these soils take to recover. We were actually warned by USGS, whatever we did, do not reseed these areas. Give them at least two years to recover and see what comes back, because a lot of the cheap grass encroachment in the West, they attribute to reseeding efforts uh, post-fire. Um, again, we need to experiment a little bit more with our rainfall um, or with our timing of our scenes and our sampling. I think that the rainfall did kind of uh, cause some noise in there, so uh, that needs to be considered. And again, like Ed said, the impact is relative. You know, you could lose your pine forest, but then you've got these amazing grass communities that are coming in. So if you're a cattle rancher, uh, the land bounced back pretty fast. If you're a forester, well, then you've got some severe impacts to the landscape. So it's all, it all depends on what you're looking at. Implications, uh, I want to reiterate the fact that I think that they are a valid tool for rapid assessment. They do provide an x-ray, not necessarily an MRI, but they do give you an idea of where you need to go next and uh, what needs to be evaluated and what needs to be researched more. Uh, they do warrant more calibration for the region for future large-scale fires, which we can expect for this area. And um, I also think they can be incorporated into models that address wildlife recovery. Uh, land planning, and I do want to say also economic impacts. We talked to FSA during the fires, and all they had were perimeter maps to allocate disaster funding to these landowners, whereas some landowners were heavily impacted with severe burns, and others had mostly low to moderate burns. Well, those ranchers in the middle are going to bounce back a lot faster than those who had a lot of the severely burned areas. And so we've actually discussed the possibility of developing economic models for um, things like that. Um, I do think that, uh, before I finish on this last slide, I want to I um, emphasize the tool for conveying, um, you know, wildfire impacts to the public. Um, and it's important that they do understand the type of recovery, recovery, the timing and the variability within the fire. Because some people, you know, when you first go out after a fire, it can be pretty darn shocking. And uh, you see a completely black landscape. But when we did listen to USGS and we gave, for example, the Serranes del Burro a whole year and I have to recover, it's amazing just the input that I'm getting from the landowners on how satisfied they are with how well the landscape is recovering. So um, again, I think these tools can be applied in uh, the social sciences when working with the public after these large wildfires. So for those of you who are actually interested in um, you know, conducting burn severity maps or want to have that tool available to you, I just thought I'd put together a real quick checklist here of uh, what you'll need to do. Because when I first started this project, it was, it was uh, you know, kind of this colossal thing that seemed formidable to me, that how in the world am I going to accomplish this task? I know nothing about this. But knowing what I know now, it's actually pretty simple if you take one, one step at a time. So the first thing you need to do is obtain your pre and your post fire Landsat scene. You can either do that yourself through the use of our manual that Eros put out, or uh, I don't know that RSAC wants me to tell everybody this, but actually U.S. Forest Remote Sensing Application Laboratory will do these uh, burn severity maps for you upon request. And so that information is available online on this last slide that I have for those links. Um, we just called them and they made the maps for us, but then they showed us how to do them ourselves as well. So they provide that service. Then you go in and you construct your NBR and your DNBR maps. You go out into the field and you conduct your CBIs. Then you load your data and your photo plots. You can use Firemon or FEET. A lot of people have heard that uh, word tossed around in the fire world. That's the database that they use to um, 
kind of collect all of this information. There are other formats that you can use, but I recommend, recommend the one that everybody else uses so that you can compare your fires to everybody else. Then you test and adjust your burn severity breakpoints through regressions, and then you reclassify your burn severity map. Sounds a lot simpler than it is, but in all actuality, it really wasn't that difficult, and now I have a lot more confidence about being able to go in there and um, you know, do a burn severity map. I do want to acknowledge our partners. We had uh, just an amazing uh, level of collaboration on this. Our funding was provided by the Nature Conservancy and by Texas A&M AgriLife Research, and we want to thank all of those fine people that are listed on this slide, because uh, without all of this help, we could not have done it. And I do want to tell you that we had a very paltry budget to do this project, because it had to happen so fast, and because people have not used them in Texas before, we had very little funding interest. I do think that that is increasing. However, I do uh, want to emphasize that you can get this done on about $5 a day. So um, don't let that throw you off. And I'm going to end with this uh, important links page that if you have um, an ability to do a screen capture, I would do that here. And uh, I do know that Pete's going to post this later as well on the Extension website so you can go back in and grab it. But these are some of the most important links. Of course, MTBS, Monitoring Trends for Burn Severity, they go through the whole explanation of burn severity maps, the different options that you have. Um, framed ecological monitoring utilities provided us with a lot of the publications that we needed. And of course, then you have places like RSAC, um, you know, the, uh, the EROS lab, and uh, I would recommend that, you know, you join somebody like the Southwest Fire Consortium just to get input. But the one thing I do want to emphasize is that there are a lot of people out there willing to help, um, and I never felt like I was alone in all of this. And uh, I also want to thank Jay Anger and Ed Rhodes for their help in coming in and kind of, you know, just backing us up with helping us to address some of this understory um, question. So at that point, I think we can open it up to questions and um, have at it. Well, thank you. Uh, as folks uh, type out the questions so y'all can answer, uh, as I type in, let me go ahead and say that uh, here in a little bit, you won't get a pop up. Uh, a satisfaction survey, please uh, complete the survey. Take time, your, your response are anonymous and information to future webinars, so thank you. The next thing I'll say that our next upcoming webinar is going to be on uh, October 2nd, uh, 2014, at noon, and Dr. Morgan Russell is going to be talking to us about the uh, brush busters. So join us in. Here a little bit, you're going to be getting this, uh, this poll coming up. Please answer it. Your questions are totally anonymous and it will help us. Thank you. So now we'll kind of sit here and, and uh, answer some questions. And yes, and Andy, uh, I will I will send you the link. Uh, it should, after the recording renders, uh, I'll send you a link. If you look at the, if you look down there at the test bar, you see a little green icon. With Pete, if there are any questions, you'll have to read them to me because I have the um, survey and I can't see my screen anymore. All right, so you. I know whenever I send out the survey, oh, I don't have that on my screen. screen but, uh, oh, I see it. Okay, I got it. To me, if you click okay. on the two little colors down at the test bar, will come up. Okay, uh, there's a question. Yeah, John, it has been below average, but for that particular time when we were sampling, it just really impacted the amount of grass growth, which I think uh, confounded our maps a little bit just because of the level of greenness. And uh, I will say, too, that we sampled after the scenes were acquired. So there was some noise in there because of that. So during that four week period was probably the only time that the Davis Mountains had had, um, you know, rain during that time. But it just so happened that it, uh, that it fell, you know, during our sampling period.
John, you know, he's, uh, John was, um, I'm going to re reiterate that John was uh, saying that, you know, Davis Mountain's annual rainfall has been below average. Again, we want to emphasize that um, it just, you really have to think about these things and how they impact, you know, your sampling period and that sort of thing. One of the areas that we got really confused about was the fact that um, MTBS wanted us to wait an entire growing season for us to go out and sample to actually, you know, get a good idea of what the impact was on the vegetation. However, many of you remember that was the most, you know, that was a historic drought after that. We didn't have a growing season. We couldn't really see green up. So there was some, some confusion there, and you can see why I believe we need uh, a significant amount of validation on these maps before we can ever get to the point where we can whip one of them out with a lot of confidence that, um, that our maps are actually reading what's really going on on the ground. Uh, I wanted to also mention that we're doing some collaborative work with Helen Poulos, who has uh, quite a data set for the Davis Mountains Preserve, um, and she's been looking at drought. So hopefully when we partner up with Helen and overlay some of these maps, we might be able to pull out some of the noise caused by drought and tree mortality as well. Um, I want to mention that uh, I can be found on the Ecosystem Science um, and Management website through tamu.edu, and uh, my contact information is there. So if you do have any questions or need any information, feel free to contact me. Um, our objective is to get as many people you know, using this method as possible on some of these wildfires. Um, a number of people from Texas Forest Service and Texas Parks and Wildlife also went through that burn severity workshop. Uh, that EROS put on for us about a year and a half ago. So there are people in the state who are now trained to do this. The, I just looked at the rainfall data for one of our FIGRO transects, and we got nearly 12 inches from the 1st of June to the 1st of August. Yeah. Yeah, so that can that can really mess up your field your field objective, not only uh, cause vehicle problems and so forth, but uh, we had quite a time with all of that mud. But um, you know, sometimes when you when things don't work out right in the field, that kind of emphasizes some of the biggest problems, which is actually quite useful for us. So it's helping us to iron. 